Good morning, good morning. We hope people could uh, take their seats and we could start a great discussion. Good morning, Governor Wolf, Governor Hutchinson, good morning. Governor Cooper, Governor Walker, thanks for your joining us. Thank you very much. Governor Scott. And we want to thank members of the audience if they can take their seats and we can start a really important discussion about pathways to prosperity. Governor Malloy, good to see you this morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, good morning. We have a, a really uh, great discussion ahead of us this morning um, of pathways to prosperity, examining our possibilities of innovation and post-secondary education and career-connected learning for our precious kids in the future of this nation. We know that the uh, font of all wisdom, wisdom is uh, a repository in the uh, governor's offices. And we know that uh, we have the greatest collection of educational leaders in the history of the country and the governors on a bipartisan basis. I, I think there's a bipartisan consensus about that this morning. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. I'm gonna kick it off a little bit by some comments. Few things we'll look forward to discussing today. How do we help families finance higher education? How do we make it more accessible to diverse communities? How do we expand opportunities for career-connected uh, learning? How do we use data to really uh, use strategies to prioritize our investment? I'm looking forward to everyone's comments about that. Just preliminary comment about, I know governors have been doing some really progressive work trying to make higher education more affordable and accessible to our families. We know the crushing debt burden that our families have, and we recognize we got talent uh, on a bipartisan basis. Governor Jerry Brown in California has uh, really championed a new system in that regard. Uh, Governor uh, Bevan in Kentucky is overseeing a $100 million bond issue to scale up workforce development, which is really exciting. Uh, we've got governors uh, across the state. Governor Brown, uh, my neighbor in Oregon, and others have made the first couple of years free. So congratulations to all the governors who are fighting on this front. And we know there's innovation on this front that's available too. If I can just talk about a couple things that have been successful in, our, in my state. Uh, a program we call the uh, Opportunity Scholarship which allows uh, students, if they make a commitment to a STEM career, to finance their college education. It has been very helpful for diverse communities who previously have had low graduation rates and it's raised their graduation rates all the way through four-year programs up above the 90% level. And it's happened because we've had a private and public partnership in helping to finance this. Uh, we've got a fellow named Gary Rubens, who's a very successful business person in our state who's honchoed this. And this thing has been a spectacular success by having a few dollars from the public and the privates that have raised these communities that historically have had 50% graduation rates just in high school or 60%, up to 90% plus through a four-year degree program in STEM degrees, these high demand fields. We have a program called College Bound, which goes to kids, uh, mostly uh, low-income kids in diverse populations. If they'll agree to keep their nose clean and get a good GPA, they get a four-year program paid. And we have increased graduation rates by 20, like 25%, once these kids have a, a vision for their future to get them through high school. So we know innovation works, and I'm looking forward to other ideas on how to do that. We know that we have to uh, look at innovation in our, kind of our non-college uh, environment on how to give people connection to the jobs of the future. And I don't know what your experience is, but in my experience, uh, there's one thing that I say when I'm talking to any group in the state of Washington, Republican, Democrat, Chambers, Urban Rural, there's one thing I say that gets universal applause, and that is that we do have to quit telling our kids that if they don't get a four-year degree, they're a failure in life. And everybody kind of gets that transitional need we have and giving our kids educational opportunities. So governors are leading in this way in many, many ways. I'll just share a little experience in Washington. Uh, uh, we had the first apprenticeship program of advanced manufacturing where kids are actually in a paid apprenticeship program. We're in their high school in Tacoma, Washington. And we had the first group of 12. It was actually the first we've done 
Uh, Governor Hickenlooper has done a good job in Colorado and others on this as well. I'm not the only one. But we had the first rollout of the first 12, and they came to sign up to sign up with a company they were going to have an apprenticeship with, and they'd come up, and they put their hat on or their company logo, and they put the shirt on, and it was exciting as draft day in the NBA. I mean, LeBron James wasn't as exciting as these kids who were signing up for an apprenticeship program. And I think that's a future we got to give all of our kids. 70% of the, the kids in Switzerland at age 17 and 18 are in paid apprenticeships. As a result, they have almost no unemployment in their, in their young population in Switzerland. Uh, we had our first apprentice program. So we had the very first computer scientist coding apprenticeship program. Uh, the last two classes, they have 100% employment. A lot of these people were in midlife. And to go into a coding program and give them an apprenticeship has been spectacularly successful. And I'm looking forward to everybody sharing their ideas as well. We know we got to do a better job given diverse populations access to higher education. We're doing that. Our dreamers are getting um, financial aid to make sure that our dreamers have access. And some, these are some of the most ambitious, smartest kids in our state. Our kids have maybe been 18 years in our country and they want to become doctors and lawyers. And I don't know what DC is going to do and how they treat our dreamers. But in our state, we want them to become doctors and lawyers and they're doing that big time. And I'm glad we're, we're giving them a chance to actually finance that. We know we have some challenges here in D.C., and I'm going to look forward to joining my governors and helping our members of Congress understand our challenges. There are some threats right now in the Higher Education Act. Uh, there's some proposed cuts uh, to some support systems, and I hope we're all going to be vocal in talking to our legislators to see to it that we don't go backwards in our financial uh, aid system. So I want to thank everybody who's uh, pitching in on this, and uh, I want to turn it over to South Dakota's great governor, um, who has inspired us in so many ways. And I just want to tell you, you've been one of the most inspirational voices I've heard making sure that our kids with disabilities get access as well. And Governor, thank you, and thanks for your leadership. Thank you, Governor Inslee. Uh, thank you all for being here for this presentation, for this uh, great panel. Today we have the pleasure of being joined by Kevin McCary, who's the Vice President for Education Policy and Knowledge Management at New America, where he directs their education policy program. In addition, Kevin is the author of a book called The End of College, Creating the Future of Learning and the University of Everywhere. And uh, I know he's happy to have me mention that's available on Amazon. but. Uh, He's been thinking about this and writing about this, so I'm interested to hear from Kevin. Also joining us today is Susan Mojica. She is a former Arizona State University student, a participant in the Starbucks College Achievement Plan, and currently a candidate for a master's in public health at George Mason University. Thank you both for being here today. And I'm going to turn it over to Doug Ducey now to recognize our third panelist and our first presenter. Governor Ducey. Thank you, thank you very much, Governor Dugard. And as the governor of Arizona, I take great pride in introducing a force of nature from Arizona. Uh, Michael Crow came to Arizona State in 2002 via Columbia University, where he was vice provost and in charge of, of science and technology. He came to our state with a grand vision to create a new American university. And the proof is really in the pudding. Not only with the Fulbright scholars that he's been able to attract, retain, and graduate, but with the distinction of being named the nation's most innovative university for the third year running by US News and World Report, beating out institutions such as Stanford and MIT. This is a gentleman that has not only transformed this university, he has laid the groundwork to transform the state. The Barrett Honors College at Arizona State University was recently called by the New York Times as the nation's gold standard in honors colleges, the equivalent of an Ivy League education at an incredible value to our Arizona students. So it gives me great pride to introduce, and if we could give a warm NGA welcome to President Michael Crow. Thank you, uh, Governor Ducey, and um, 
Governors, it's uh, an honor to have and a privilege to be here to be able to speak with you. I, I come in uh, hard off the stagecoach from Arizona, uh, a 48th state uh, added to the lower 48, the frontier. Uh, the frontier where new models that can help us to actually shape our future are possible. Uh, we have been able to build a new university model, and I, and I mean literally a new university model. We call it the new American university. It could have been called uh, the old idea of what an American public university was supposed to be, one that was connected to everyone, working with everyone, advancing everyone, unbelievably efficient, unbelievably effective, all of those things. It could be what the future would need, which is a university which has uh, a connection also to everyone, connecting at all levels of education and to every citizen that needs something from the university. You all as governors are the arbiters of the future. Your constitutional assignments are unique in our democracy. You have the unique responsibility for advancing and designing those elements of our democracy that are most critically dependent upon education and for overseeing those educational processes in each of the states. So the question to each of you is, can we build a new kind of college or university, community college, uh, uh, local four-year public college, massive public research university. Can we build a system within higher education, public higher education in particular, that can be actually adaptive, actually respond to the changes that are around us rather than something that you've all been told, well, the fact that you're really running that place, or we can't get any done, anything done at that place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here's what we're facing. We're facing, and you all are facing as governors, I think, uh, and I use this word intently, a fundamental economic and social change moment. Like nothing that anyone alive today or our parents or our grandparents or our great-grandparents have ever experienced. And that is the rate of technological advance will accelerate infinitely. And through that acceleration, all things that we think about, the way an economy works, the way work is done, the definition of work, the definition of education, the definition of a career, the definition of a job, the definition of labor, the definition of all things will be altered by the fact that we all carry around supercomputers in our pocket, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know all of that. You match that with the growing diversity of the American population. You match that with the unbelievable rise of global economic powers, which is fantastic to the long-term benefit of the population of humanity on this planet. You match all of that together, and then you say, what does it take for us to be successful in the future? And I'm not a politician, but I am going to say that you know, if it's not 4% or higher economic growth on a three-year running average in all or most of the states and then aggregating to a national level, then we've got problems related to social mobility. We've got problems relative to the further advancement of our population. We've got problems with continuing the American dream if we can't maintain that level of economic advance. If we can't graduate by the age of 18, 90 to 95% of our high school students, we're basically assigning them to a life of suffering. We're assigning them to a life of suffering. And you as governors, you all know all of this. If we can't get at least 60% in the foreseeable future to some kind of post-secondary certificate, and I'm using old terms, high school, old term, post-secondary, old term, college, old term. These are fixed boxes of the past. If we can't, can't get 60% to some kind of post-secondary certificate, we're not going to have a workforce capable of being able to adjust quickly enough to the thing that's changing everything, which is ubiquitous, high-speed, forever, forever, forever technological advance. If we can't do that, our ability to accelerate social mobility, our ability for our democracy to work will actually be at some point challenged. Now, unfortunately, each of you and me in the 16 years that I've been at Arizona State, we all inherited a design for public higher education that is rigid, fixed, largely incapable of understanding how to modernize. And I don't mean individual programs or individual initiatives or this group or this center. I mean in aggregate. So since 1980, the United States government has assisted citizens of the United States to go to college through Pell Grants. More than half of them have no degree. Half a trillion dollars of expenditures. What do you call a person that goes to college in the United States today and doesn't finish? 33 million or so of those individuals are living in our states. What's the word? What do you call someone that didn't finish college? Dropout. 
It's a derogatory term. So we have a system of higher education which uses derogatory terms to label people that didn't finish their institution which couldn't adjust to helping them to finish. And so this fixed model of higher education is so intense that I'll give you two examples. So one of your former governors is now the president of Purdue University, Mitch Daniels. And Mitch Daniels has been unbelievably innovative in driving forward a number of initiatives. And he recently was so bold as to try to acquire an online platform so that he could scale Purdue University's land-grant mission to something other than just the few kids that could come there and attend the university in a physical form. Could he take the land-grant model and expand it out so that everyone would have an opportunity to engage Purdue, which is a world-class, fantastic, unbelievable institution? Could he do that? He took that risk. What's going on now is faculty have assembled, voting against him. They're going to go up to Chicago here in a few days and meet with the Higher Learning Commission and urge that this thing that he acquired from the market that he's converting into a not-for-profit arm to extend the power of Purdue University not be accredited, called Purdue Global. Now that is, and I will say it, and I know people are watching, that's insanity to those of you on the Purdue faculty. I mean, I'm just telling you. <laughs> we did a program a few years ago, and you're going to hear from one of our graduates with the Starbucks Corporation. Starbucks has more than 130 or 40,000 employees in the United States, half or so went to college and never finished. Couldn't a great, conscious, capitalist corporation company like Starbucks, working with their partners, work with a civic-minded university to develop a program that could find a way to get people that had started college, were out in the workforce, had debt, had some problem, couldn't solve the problem, could we come together and figure out a way so you could graduate from college from a great university with no debt? So we launched the program. We've graduated 1,000 people. We have 7,000 students in the program with Starbucks right now. We plan on graduating 25,000, for which we had to do brand control to maintain damage control on our own brand because only a low-life scum university would be so foolish as to divert the energy of its elite faculty to educating college dropouts working at Starbucks. That's how bad it has gotten. So, out on the frontier, here's what we decided to do. I was 12 years at Columbia University as executive vice provost there and a faculty member there, grew up there, got tenure there. That was sort of like proving that one could be, you know, operate at that, at that kind of level. But I learned a lot of lessons there, and one of the things that I learned was that innovation was central to everything, and innovation was largely anachronistic to academic culture, except in a science laboratory or an engineering laboratory where engineering prospers around the inventions and discoveries and technologies. And so out on the frontier, here's what we decided to do, and i got to walk through this quickly. We built a new design at all levels. First was purpose. The university does not exist for the faculty. I'm, I'm, this is serious business. <laughs> Our university exists first for the students, second for the community and the community we serve, and lastly, the fact they are the means rather than the end of the institution. So to do that, we redefined our entire purpose. We restructured a charter built around what a public university is supposed to be. Our, our institution will be measured by inclusion versus exclusion and the success of our students. We'll actually measure the success of the university based on who we include and how our students succeed. Second, we'll measure the research power of the university by what did we do to actually benefit the public in a measurable way. And then lastly, and this is well articulated in our charter, which you can find, the university actually will take responsibility for the outcomes of our community, economic, social, educational, health, and well-being. So if K-12 is underperforming, we're partly to blame, and we better look at it as something that we're partly responsible for, for example. Second, we changed the design of the university. Most of the universities and colleges and community colleges that you all oversee or fund or interact with in one way or another, they're run like public agencies. That's an archaic model which will never deliver to you what you want. They will not be able to become efficient. They will not be able to become effective. They will not be able to largely increase their efficacy with some exceptions because the design is wrong. So we went away from the agency model to what we call the enterprise model. And an enterprise, we're actually responsible for finding resources beyond those resources provided to us by the government. Now, all universities do this, and some universities do it more than others, but a fundamental design shift. I'm still on the list of, we set out to design a different kind of university. We changed our clock speed. 
this watch that my uh, wife gave me uh, uh, many years ago, it actually measures the rotation of the Earth and the speed of the Earth's rotation, not a semester. So each second is not a semester. So in a normal academic watch, it's you know, five seconds is five semesters. That's two and a half years. That doesn't work. The clock speed of a modern, adaptive public university must be at the speed of the economy, the speed of change, the speed of what it takes to be competitive. Technology. We embraced technology like no tomorrow. Here's what Bommel's Law says about organizations that do not embrace technology. All organizations, this is a Nobel Prize winning economist, if you don't embrace technology, your price will rise infinitely, period. Healthcare suffers from this, academia suffers from this, so we embrace technology in every possible way, and I, I do have a punchline that I'm working toward. We have 175 technology partners integrated into our institution on campus, allowing us to project off of campus, allowing us to do other things, scale. All campuses sit in some sort of isolated interactive arena where they just believe that they have to solve everything themselves. Their scale is what they think of as the learners that come to their campus. And if you don't finish at one of these campuses, you're a dropout and you're a cast off, you're cast away. We decided to change the scale of the focus of the institution to social scale. Could we help 10 corporations or big companies like Starbucks to graduate another 100,000 people over a number of years, eliminating college debt as a problem? Could we, could we scale where we could find a way to work with the entire K-12 community? We did. We built a digital platform now engaged with the entire K-12 community. Could we build charter schools to prove certain things and then integrate them as, and in as learning centers and so forth? Could we operate at scale? The answer is yes. Could we combine excellence and access into a single institution? Academic excellence means you actually allow your faculty members to think well of themselves rather than giving them the job of only being a teacher. If you call them only a teacher and you call it a college or a university, they will forever believe themselves to be in a social hierarchy where they are by definition second class. If they are by definition second class, soon they will be unionized and soon they will be organizing against you. That's the way it works. Resources. We acquire our resources not from the Lord and Master, the state government. The state government invests what they can. Our other resources are acquired through partnerships and through engagement in the market and through engagement in the advancing of our ideas and our activities. Access. If the university itself is not accessible to the broadest cross-section of society and it calls itself a public university, then it has not been successful. Our student body is representative of the entire socioeconomic diversity of our state and our region. It took 12 years of changes to be able to get there, and we've been there for four years at that level of diversity. Unbelievable changes. And then finally, quality. If it's not quality, don't do it. Close it, shut it, eliminate it, change it, change the leaders, do whatever's necessary if it's not quality. So here's the results. I'll give you two examples. Governor Ducey knows that in all states, including Arizona, we're really interested in having more STEM graduates. So just picking that one area, we decided to eliminate all of our engineering departments in 2008, change the basic logic of our engineering school, change the logic such that we could change who would attend the school, who would graduate from the school. Could we get more women, more minorities, more people in engineering overall? We created five grand challenge engineering schools and an older model called a polytechnic school. We combined those things together, long story short, 8,000 students in engineering in 2008 with a 68% freshman retention rate. This year we have 21,000 students in engineering, 17,000 on campus, 4,000 online, and a 90% freshman in, uh, retention rate. The online students have the world's first fully accredited online electrical engineering degree for undergraduates. Robots, everything you can imagine, unbelievable degree format so that the guy sitting on a ship or the woman sitting on a ship off the coast of uh, Korea or Afghanistan while they're working, serving our country can also get an electrical engineering degree, not a, not a basket weaving degree online. And so we're actually trying to produce fantastic opportunities at the university. University outcomes, and this is really the crux of the story. Since 2003, 2002 was the first year that we began implementing the new model. We produced three times as many graduates as we produced in 2003. We went from 8,000 to 24,000 graduates, just from our institution. Five times the level of research, more research than is going on outside of medicine at Stanford, at UCLA, at USC, at Harvard, at Princeton, 
at Carnegie Mellon, a range of schools, a huge metamorphosis of our faculty. We have 10 times the number of learners, that is someone taking at least one course from us online, 10 times. We have a 95% improvement in our four-year graduation rate. 95% improvement using technologies, using innovation, using this, using that. We have a 75% reduction in the cost to the state to produce a single degree. Our faculty is the same size. That is a metamorphic transformation because out on the frontier, where we are, we don't have a fixed idea of what we're supposed to be. Most universities have become fixed ideas. Fixed. That doesn't work anymore. It worked very well. We have unbelievable achievements, and it doesn't mean everyone has to change. And so our 2025 goals are even more significant. 32,000 graduates matching the diversity of our society, men, women, ethnicity, socioeconomic class, what have you. No predictability based on family income for graduation. And what's the key drive? New design, new design, new design. Any one of you as governors that are attempting to enhance the productivity of your universities by managing the present design, you will not be successful. With some exceptions, you will not be successful. A new design is required, a new model, a new way of looking at things, particularly to operate at scale. So you all know definitively that for a 10-year-old child today, born in 2008, for that child, 60% of the jobs that that child will have access to when they enter the workforce, and I don't mean this lightly, they do not exist. We don't even know what they will be called. All we know is that for them to be able to do those jobs successfully, to advance our country economically and socially and culturally, they will have to be master learners of some type. You can't do that unless you can scale in a way that we've never been able to scale before. So thank you for the invitation and a little story from the stagecoach from Arizona. Thank you. Uh, we now are happy to have Susanna Mojica, who is a Starbucks partner and first generation college graduate from Virginia. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> My five-year-old daughter was really excited that I would get to speak with the state bosses, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. My parents are from Mexico. They immigrated to the United States to give us a better opportunity. Um, I was born in California. And growing up, it wasn't a question if I would be going to college. Um, that was my main goal. Um, the only issue was that once it came time to go to college, there was no money there. Uh, my parents didn't have the resources to save for college. So as determined as I was, I said, I'll take loans out. It's OK. So I flew from California to New York, went to Syracuse for a year. And after the first year, I knew that there was no way that I could graduate from there in four years and have that large of a loan over my head. How would I live? How would I survive? So I got scared and I became a dropout. Um, it definitely had a negative connotation, um, one that kind of stuck with me. Um, at that time, I fell in love and got married to my husband, Edgar. I have 17 years now. He's in the Coast Guard and we started moving around. Um, I didn't know how to bring my education back in with so many deployments. Um, would I be studying and we would have to deploy? Would those credits transfer? Would I then waste even more money? After a few years, I had three beautiful children. Um, and at that point, they became my priority. From then on, I said, OK, I will save for college, for your college. You won't have these same concerns and worries that I had when it was time for me to go. So they became the priority. Um, I then started working at Starbucks. Um, it was just meant to be a very, very casual um, part-time job. Um, the College Achievement Program was then announced, and I signed up that very same day. Um, I knew that that was, I get very emotional about it. <laughs> I knew that this was my opportunity to go back to school. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> <clears throat> So I started attending the very first session that was offered. Um, fast forward to May of 2017, I flew to Arizona and walked across that stage and got my diploma. <laughs> wow. 
It can be said that it's been my determination, my hard work that has gotten me to the point where I'm at. Um, but it wasn't just my doing. It was Starbucks in Arizona State that gave me this lucky break, that created this opportunity for me to thrive, that believed in me and looked at it as a social project and not an investment. Um, through this, I have gained so much confidence. Um, I am currently enrolled at George Mason, working towards a Master's of Public Health. Um, I should be graduating next spring and I was promoted to assistant store manager, so I should uh, be running my own Starbucks here in a few months. Um, without this program, I wouldn't be here. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful for the partnership um, that Dr. Crow and that Dr. Schultz um, came up with. Um, that investment in us resonates at the store level. I have a few partners. We refer to ourselves as partners at Starbucks. I have a few partners at my store that are participating in the program and it, it's just created such, such a different environment in our stores and in the confidence of our fellow partners. Thank you so much for letting me share my story with you. Thank you. It's for you. Uh, thank you, Susanna. It is our uh, uh, profound hope that uh, when you're done with your degree that you'll apply for a job with your great new governor in Virginia, too. I think that uh, we're going to give him your resume if that's okay. We now have Kevin Carey, who's Vice President of Education Policy and Knowledge Management at New America. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Governor. Thanks so much to all of you. Um, thanks so much to all of you for letting me uh, come to talk today. I, I'll be brief so we can get to the discussion. I'm going to talk a little bit about, from the DP, DC perspective, uh, the Federal Higher Education Act. Um, so this is the big omnibus federal legislation that governs everything from Pell Grants to student loans to sexual harassment policy to work study and everything in between. Um, it's a good time to be talking about the Higher Education Act. Congress um, basically only does this about once every 10 years. It's been 10 years since the last time, um, and the last time was 10 years before that. So a lot is at stake, um, both from a financial standpoint and from a regulatory standpoint. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Uh, one is information and data, and the other is new models to help students get better jobs. Uh, as we all know, the states are the foundation of the American higher education system. You establish these universities, you pay for them, then the federal government comes in after you're done, provides Pell Grants and loans so low-income students can go to college, particularly at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level. A lot of the research funding comes from the federal level, um, and a lot of the loan money that pays for grad school is federal loan money as well. So both the states and the federal government have a common interest, um, and that's information. What are we getting as taxpayers and governments for all that money? Are students graduating? Are students getting jobs? Are they going to graduate school? Uh, what kind of jobs are they? Can they pay their loans back? Um, this is actually surprisingly hard information to come by sometimes. Um, and the reason is we have a national market for higher education and a national market for labor. So while a lot of states are doing really good work in improving the quality of their data systems, Oftentimes, um, you're limited to what happens inside your state. So if you're in a big multi-state metropolitan area and you have a lot of people getting jobs in other states, if they're transferring and graduating somewhere else, it's hard for states to know that. Um, so there's an opportunity uh, for the federal government to essentially fill in the gaps and provide all of you with more information, um, both about your institutions of higher education and just in general, how your workforce and education and labor systems are working. So if you are competing to bring with one another on a friendly basis, I'm sure, for a big uh, economic development opportunity, somebody wants to locate in your business, you can provide them with the best possible information um, about both the quality of your institutions and what's happening to all of your college graduates. Um, so there's some legislation actually out there right now. It's called the College Transparency Act. Um, it would allow the federal government to fill in these gaps in the information that you have. Um, it's bipartisan, it's bicameral. Everyone from Senator Orrin Hatch to Senator Elizabeth Warren has supported this. 
Um, all of the major associations of public colleges and universities uh, that, that work for you and, and you work for them, um, as well as the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable. Um, so this is just one of the things that the federal government does well. The federal government doesn't do everything well. Um, I started my career working for Indiana Governor Frank O'Bannon. I haven't forgotten, I've been here in DC for a while, but I haven't forgotten the uh, state perspective in all these things. But one of the limited roles that the federal government can, can do a good job with is to provide information that goes across states um, for the whole country. So data, I think, is gonna be a key thing and a key opportunity in the Higher Education Act. The second thing is to really get better about jobs. Governor Inslee talked about apprenticeships, um, and Washington State is really a leader in this area. Um, apprenticeships are an old idea where there's really an opportunity to translate them now to uh, the new labor market of the future. It's absolutely correct. We can't just have a system that depends on people getting four-year degrees. Most people don't get four-year degrees. Um, we need a system that works, that provides status, that provides pathways to jobs beyond the very upper level professional classes. But we need to do it in a way that doesn't segregate and bifurcate our population into two different areas. And so if you look at countries like Switzerland, for example, which as we know has been very, very successful um, in providing more apprenticeship opportunities, apprenticeship there is not separate from the higher education system. It's part of the higher education system. So at the same time that we want to create more opportunities for apprenticeships in new fields, fields like healthcare, fields like IT, outside of the traditional building trades, um, we don't want to create pathways that have no way to get back into the higher education system. So one idea that we've been talking about at New America is this idea of, uh, and again, this is where the federal government can play a role by providing some standardization uh, create a category of a student apprentice. So when, um, where you can register as a student apprentice in the same way that you register as a student or you register as an apprentice. So we can provide resources, so we can connect information about those apprentices with local businesses, so businesses know uh, what kind of training programs are going on and can connect in to be a partner in creating policy around them. Um, where we could provide some resources perhaps to help uh, subsidize the tuition that apprentices have um, and also subsidize some of the costs of providing the training. So we're the only country really with an apprenticeship program where businesses have to pay the whole cost um, of the wage subsidies and of the education as they're kind of going along. So this is a, a field, I, I think a modern apprenticeship is really a, an idea whose time has come. Um, Businesses need people with these skills. People need these skills to get connected to businesses. Um, and this is a role where a limited federal role in partnership with states can really make a big difference. And finally, I'll, I'll just close by offering, I guess, a, a broad observation about some of the conversations I think you'll be hearing as we move ahead with the Higher Education Act. Um, everyone has a different perspective on these things. And I think um, states and institutions have a shared need and a shared agenda when it comes to making sure that our federal loan programs and grant programs are there for our colleges and our students when we need them. When you get into some of these issues around data and transparency, that's where sometimes the agendas can diverge a little bit. And you may have someone from some of your colleges come to you and say, well, we should really push back on these federal efforts to provide more information. Um, it's intrusive. It's, not, it's, it's too much power here in Washington, not enough out of the states kind of using the language of federalism to make an argument against information. Really, it's often an argument against transparency. It's an argument against accountability. Um, great universities like Arizona State are 100% on board with more information because they know that when you're transparent about how you're doing, outcomes like, like the, the great speech we just heard just now, innovation, new programs, new people and ideas, Places like Arizona State look great the more information you put out there. But not all colleges are like Arizona State. Not all universities are as good as Arizona State. Some of them, we need to provide consumers with more information so they'll make good choices. And we need to provide all of you with more information so you can focus on quality, have the right leaders, uh, move people in the right directions, and govern the way that you need to govern your institutions. Um, so we have a great opportunity with the Higher Education Act um, and to really move the American higher education system ahead so we have both the innovation, the quality, and the access that all of our students and families need. 
Thanks again for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to the conversation. So uh, we've got uh, a portion where we can ask questions for this great panel. And it is a great panel, and I appreciate it. Uh, we have just uh, witnessed the first bipartisan standing ovation, Susanna. That's quite, a, <laughs> quite an achievement. Uh, President Crow, your comments were so inspirational, I almost feel bad about the Husky uh, game against your basketball team a couple weeks ago, but, but that's how'd that, okay. How did that football game go last Yeah, time? I don't know. I don't know how that went. <laughs> so here's a question. Um, if we... If I go back and talk to my presidents about your presentation, which is incredibly exciting, mm -hmm. and talk about the need for innovation and talk about some of the innovative systems you've used, and, um, and they respond to, to those ideas, um, what would they say that, that might uh, create a resistance to some of those ideas, and how would you respond to those, and what could governors do most effectively to help college leadership along the path that you, you have chosen? What works to free them or enable them or inspire them in that regard? So what's interesting is that typically what, I, I'm very familiar with the UW and Washington State uh, presidents in, in the state of Washington, and so you know, they would say, interesting experiment going in the right direction, uh, different model than we have, that kind of thing, the stuff that's going on at ASU. But typically what we hear is, well, you know, well, they don't have unions in Arizona, so they can get things done there. Or what we'll hear is, um, uh, and we do have unions in Arizona, we don't have union employees at ASU uh, unionized. And so they'll say that um, it's, it's too top-down, all of the solutions have to come from the faculty. You, you, you basically go back to what I said, it's a faculty-centric model. And so the way to change that up is to set expectations and goals for the universities that are, because we live in such a privileged position, we are in an you all as governors have created public universities and, and colleges that live in privilege. We now need to be given an unbelievable assignment. And the assignment is we're interested in you educating the kids that come to the university and the college at the highest possible level, graduating the kids that come to the community colleges, which, which uh, very few do graduate from the community colleges, uh, advancing to a level of metrics, the part of Kevin's uh, point, that's off the charts, meaning we need, we need goals that are really difficult to achieve. We also need, uh, as I said in the earlier comments, to be freed from uh, bureaucratic uh, controls. Uh, they're, these, they're, these are institutions that, if freed from certain controls, can deliver more, but they have to be held, held accountable, and those are new models. And so what you'll hear from folks in Washington or from other uh, places is that, well, what we really need is just more money from the legislature. Uh, what we really need is just more capital investment or more this or more that. That model cannot scale under any circumstance to the level of educational uh, productivity required for us to prepare the population for the coming economic and technological changes. We need new models. And so what you'll hear is basically not a defense of the historic model, but you'll hear, well, this is the model we have and we're trying to work it the best that we can. And so what one has to find are those willing to innovate, empower them, see if you can get changes in their behavior from their activity and then from that, uh, use those as exemplars. That's, I think, the pathway. So faculty doesn't have to be unionized to perhaps be prickly on occasion. What has been successful for you in getting buy-in for your faculty partners? So uh, buy-in has, has come from empowering the faculty to be something other than uh, petty bureaucrats. So petty bureaucrats sit around and they worry about the chemistry department fighting against the physics department or this or this or this. We empowered our faculty to design their intellectual futures, to create new programs. We eliminated 80 academic programs at multiple levels. We created new schools like our School for Earth and Space Exploration, which is, no pun intended, taken off. And so, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we created an unbelievable school of sustainability, which is focused on economic development, economic growth, and protection of uh, the sustainability of the planet for future generations. So you empower the faculty in ways that they're, they're, they're running of these small, tight-knit, argumentative bureaucracies among and between each other. That's, that's the thing that has to be uh, free. That's the faculty governance system is a governance system of a series of bureaucratic relationships that are not innovative. Thank you. Governor uh, Inslee? Yeah, we're going to go to Governor Duvar here for a second here, I think. Yes, thank you. Kevin, uh, in your book, you talk, uh, you, the title is The University of Everything. And 
it seems to me that uh, what the University of Arizona is doing is becoming more like <laughs> Arizona State, excuse me, Arizona State is becoming more like that. And I'm wondering if you can react to that uh, description and whether it fits with what you see occurring from your vantage point. Arizona State definitely is a, a leader in this field. I mean, it's been, I think those of us who went to college a while ago now maybe don't have a sense of how quickly things are changing and how uh, normal the intensive use of technology is for both current college students and certainly future college generations of students. Um, there's, there are still going to be a lot of people who go someplace and live with other students. That's a great educational environment. We're not going to get away from that. They're going to have personal relationships with students and mentors. But a lot of people are also going to be online or they're going to split their time. Um, some classes that are uh, uh, focused in interpersonal because that's what's good for those classes. Um, but now access to great learning communities around the world at other institutions. And so the biggest thing is you won't have to take all your classes from one place anymore. Um, to make that work, we need to make sure that there's uh, uh, good systems for transferring credit so you can put together a degree from different places. Uh, we need to be open to new kinds of college credentials. Um, we need to modernize, modernize our financial aid system so people can use their student loans or their grants for degrees that actually fit the, labor, the modern labor market. But at the same time, we've got to make sure that we have a strong element of quality control and consumer protection in there. Because if we just kind of open up the floodgates and we don't look after things, there's a real opportunity for exploitation. And we've seen some of the worst of that over the last 10 years. So it's really innovation, financial access, and quality as kind of a triangle, and looking at all three of those things at the same time. And I, I would just add to that, uh, Governor, that uh, we've grown from 45,000 on-campus students to roughly 75,000 on-campus students enhance their four-year graduation rates, their productivity, their outcomes, their quality, everything. We could not have done that without an unbelievably innovative faculty and without technology as our friend. Once we built that technology platform for that way that we're teaching at scale within the university itself, we then realized that we could then reach out to others. So we have 30,000 students online in 150 online degree programs. And then one step removed from that, we have 400,000 other students who have signed up for at least one class and are interacting with us in another way. That then has led us to the point after we built a digital high school that we just released uh, this year in its first semester. Uh, we now realize that we have this little thing, to Kevin's point, we have the core of a public university operating in a research modality that can be a part of a broader initiative that we're now calling universal learner. The universal learner can be a person coming in and out of the educational system throughout their life uh, along the way, even before they're at college or university or community college or technical school or apprenticeship or whatever. You may be doing your technical apprenticeship in welding, but you need to pick up a class on uh, business or a class on engineering principles or this or that. We now realize that we can do that and not change one whit the quality of the education for the student privileged enough to come and live with us to go to school in an immersive environment. Change it not one whit. In fact, our goal by the time we're done is that all or nearly all of those students who come to the university with us won't be paying any tuition because they'll be a part of the work environment helping us to deliver this universal learner outcome to a broader population. Now, one university or college can't do that, but hundreds could, uh, if done in the right way, could affect the outcome of the entire country in a significant way. I think I saw Governor Martinez. Yes. Um, can you please explain to me um, what should the measure of, of the, how, do, how do we measure student outcomes? How should we be doing that? And should the institution be held accountable for those uh, outcomes? And if so, what should be the consequences if the outcomes are not favorable for that institution? Well, those are, those are uh, important questions with relatively easy answers. The answer is we should measure every, everything. We should measure uh, taking our graduates, you know, how well are they doing? Are they employed? What are they making? What about their life, their life outcomes, their, their employability, uh, their impact back? All those things are measurable. You also have to measure what did they actually learn? Do they actually have critical thinking skills or not? And if so, at what level? And if not, why? Et cetera. Should universities be accountable for that? Unequivocally, they should be accountable. They should be so accountable that the leadership teams of universities not meeting these goals should be replaced as rapidly as you can replace them to find people who can deliver those kinds of measurable outcomes. And if they say they, they can't deliver them, then you should 
You should definitely <laughs> replace those people. Governor Ducey. First, I want to say, Susanna, great speech. You're an inspiration, and I hope when you graduate from George Mason, you will come back to Arizona. <laughs> I'm actually from California. <laughs> uh, Dr. Crow, I want to just touch on three things and then let you take it from there, but things that I've seen and observed in Arizona that you've created. This idea of access, that a public university should not measure itself by how many applications it receives and then the kids that it excludes and only the ones that it lets in. And then talk about how you have taken the talented kids in Arizona that could leave and go anywhere they want in the country and keep them in state. And then lastly, uh, the concept of embeddedness, of you saying that uh, a university should impact its, its city and its state in a positive way. And you pointed out where our state was on the day you came and then the positive things that have happened during your tenure, and then you've pointed out other places of excellent institutions, but said, how is that city doing? Yeah. So um, on, on the question of access, so we set out consciously to say that uh, we would be egalitarian in our access. We would not be artificially fake in setting admission standards to exclude kids. So on my desk is the catalog of the University of California at Los Angeles from August 10th, 1950. To get into the University of California on that day, at, on that campus, you needed a B average. There was no tuition cost whatsoever. Uh, you needed a B in 15 courses that prepared you to do university level work. If you had that B average, you took those courses, you, you were admitted no matter how many of you there were. There was no enrollment cap, there was no cap, there was no funding model. It had not become a, a rigid uh, bureaucracy. We are doing everything that we can to implement that model from uh, 1950, everything we possibly can, to a research-grade university. So from our, our perspective, access is completely driven by have you brought in all of the talent from every family background, everywhere you possibly can. Now, for us, that's very, very challenging. All the things I'm talking about are challenging, and we've made that work. 20% of our students are from families at or below the poverty line. 50% uh, of our uh, incoming 12,000 freshmen are non-white. Uh, that's higher than the percentage of the, of the state. So we've, we have found ways through socioeconomic commitment and by not measuring ourselves based on how many kids uh, we, didn't, we didn't admit. You all know the, the, the joke about Stanford, which uh, two years ago was called uh, the most uh, successful university in the country because they admitted only 5% of their applicants. Well, the next year, the New York Times wrote a parody that said they had become the greatest university that ever lived because they admitted no one. <laughs> and their donations were through the roof. And with their new donations, they were, they were gonna advance a new center for social justice. And so, and so, um, <laughs> and so from a talent perspective, uh, you have to make certain in all of our states, there's, I, I came from Columbia University, and a lot of my colleagues at Columbia and other places, they think somehow that every smart kid at the country, in the country is at Columbia or Stanford or Harvard or Princeton. No, most of the kids there are really smart, if not gifted. But the millions of people out there that are just as capable aren't at those schools. And so we built a program, as the governor mentioned, called the Barrett Honors College, which is the size of the Stanford undergraduate student body but uh, operates in a completely different uh, income level. But more important than that, from the perspective of talent, we have decided to make the university as broadly scoped as possible. Hundreds and hundreds of undergraduate degree programs tapping into the talent of the breadth of our society, not the narrowing, narrow funneling of our society into small uh, activity. And then what the governor called embeddedness. This means we're involved in literally everything possible. The, the improvement of uh, neighborhoods, uh, uh, 40,000 students working as volunteers, uh, working in every business attraction, business retention case that you can possibly imagine down at the level of company by company by company by company. How can we be of service? How can we be engaged? How can we build custom things? How can we use our technology to project some asset that we have to some benefit of your, of your social enterprise or your business enterprise? So those are the things that we've been, that we've been working on. Governor Dugard. Thank you. Uh, President, one concern I've had in observing some of the way our higher education system has evolved is the tendency to continue to graduate uh, students in programs uh, and having degrees that 
industry no longer has need of or there's an oversupply and there's no demand and yet we don't have enough uh, it seems to me in some of these areas where less education is required in terms of seats and times and seats and yet the demand is there and I know part of that is our uh, failure to help young people understand the paths that lead to good job opportunities and the paths that maybe don't and I'm wondering if you could comment on that. So it, it, that's a difficult question because uh, we, we've seen a shift now where people are using college degrees as proxies for that must be a hard worker. So they, people are now requiring college degree, degrees for jobs that in the past didn't require college degrees. That's a very complicated thing that's going on. There's a shortage of college degrees, uh, college graduates right now in the economy. Unemployment for, for college graduates is under uh, 3% and going down. Uh, uh, unemployment for high school dropouts is uh, always uh, bad. The number of jobs in the economy for people with only a high school diploma have been plummeting for the last uh, 10, 15, or 20 years. And so what we need to do is we need a lot of new labels for things. We, we have too few labels. We call everything the same. It's a diploma. It's this. It's that. Uh, we're, 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 we, we're not producing enough differentiation uh, in, our, in our product. Now, I'm not a believer that degree A is necessarily better than degree B. So a teacher from our institution has a 7% rate of return on their investment to get their teaching degree over their lifetime. That's better than the stock market return. An engineer has better than a 20% rate of return over their lifetime. But the teacher is just as important as the engineer, even though the economy doesn't compensate them in the same way. And so I'm, I'm not judging which degrees are better than others. All degrees should be high quality. All universities and all colleges should be held accountable for the quality of their degrees and the success of their students. Going back to our charter, which you can find online, our charter says, we will be held accountable for the success of our students. We will be held accountable for the success of our communities. And so that sort of solves some of those, uh, of those issues if that can be embedded in the logic of uh, enough colleges or universities. We've got time, one more question I think, yes. Mary? Thank you, President Crow. We have an opening at the University of Oklahoma for our <laughs> president. <laughs> yeah. David has done a fantastic he job. He has done a great job. We appreciate all of your comments today. I have a couple of questions. Do you have tenure? We have tenure, but we don't allow the urban myth of what tenure, what people think tenure is to be prevailing. So tenure is an absolutely essential ingredient to the way that knowledge is created. So knowledge is created by the destruction of previous theories, the destruction of previous ideas. And without tenure, faculty members would just kill each other off attempting to protect their ideas from being attacked by others. And so it's a license to advance your ideas so long as you work hard, so long as you contribute, continue to contribute, continue to be a, a, a great uh, teacher, a great professor, so long as you don't misbehave, so long, so long as you don't abuse your position. And so tenure is a license for academic achievement. If all those other things occur and you're underperforming, you, at our institution you go through post-tenure review, most people put up for post-tenure review quit. Uh, most people that go through post-tenure review when they get the treatment for improving their behavior quit. If they then agree to that treatment, they're held accountable to improve their behavior. If they don't agree to that, uh, then they're fired. Uh, uh, if their conduct is unbecoming, they're fired. And so uh, that tenure is not a lifetime deal. Uh, we've got many, I got many scars on my back and many witness hours in the United States District Court for lawsuits, all of which that we won. Uh, to make certain that what I'm describing to you actually works the way that I'm describing it to you. Very well. Let's uh, have a round of applause for all our panelists. This has really been a great, great work today. Uh, thank you. This committee, uh, we need to be very active in the next several weeks while the reauthorization is going through. I hope you will all share your ideas, criticisms, and comments um, with us. Uh, Stephen Parker is the person, sort of the central conduit. We will collect ideas, and Governor Dugard uh, will make sure that the Congress follows uh, the best leaders, which are governors on a bipartisan basis. Good luck to us all. We're adjourned.